Frederick Douglass was born a slave in Maryland. After escaping from slavery, Douglass became the most prominent black leader of the anti-slavery movement. He toured America and Europe as an anti-slavery speaker, edited and published a newspaper, participated in the Underground Railroad, advised President Lincoln, served in several high government posts, and wrote his autobiography. Douglas was a slave, and about 12 years old, when he went to live with a new master and mistress in Baltimore. Frederick Douglass, learning to read and write. I lived in the family of Mr. Ald in Baltimore seven years. My new mistress, Mrs. Sophia, was naturally of an excellent disposition. The contempt for the rights and feelings of others and the bad humor which generally characterized the slaveholding ladies were all quite absent from her bearing toward me. She had never been a slaveholder, but had depended almost entirely upon her own industry for a living. To this fact, the dear lady no doubt owed the excellent preservation of her natural goodness of heart, for slavery could change a saint into a sinner and an angel into a demon. If little Thomas was her son and her most dearly beloved child, she made me something like his half-brother in her affections. Mrs. All was not only kind-hearted, but much given to reading the Bible and to chanting hymns of praise when alone. I must in truth characterize Master Hugh as a sour man of forbidding appearance. He cared very little about religion and was more a part of the world than his wife. He doubtless set out to be, as the world goes, a respectable man, and to get on by becoming a successful shipbuilder. This was his ambition, and it fully occupied him. During the first year or two, he left me almost exclusively to the management of his wife. My employment was to run errands and to take care of Tommy, to prevent his getting in the way of carriages, and to keep him out of harm's way generally. So for a time, everything went well. The frequent hearing of my mistress reading the Bible aloud awakened my curiosity in respect to this mystery of reading and roused in me the desire to learn. Up to this time, I had known nothing whatever of this wonderful art, and my ignorance and inexperience of what it could do for me emboldened me to ask her to teach me to read. With an inexperience equal to my own, she readily consented, and in an incredibly short time, by her kind assistance, I mastered the alphabet and could spell words of three or four letters. My mistress seemed almost as proud of my progress as if I had been her own child. And supposing that her husband would be well pleased, she exultingly told him of the aptness of her pupil and her intention to persevere in teaching me, at least to read the Bible. Well, Master Hugh was astounded beyond measure and probably for the first time proceeded to unfold to his wife the true philosophy of the slave system and the peculiar rules to be observed in the management of human chattels. Of course, he forbade her to give me any further instruction, telling her in the first place that to do so was unlawful, as it was unsafe. Far, said he, if you give a nigger an inch, he'll take an L. Learning will spoil the best nigger in the world. If he learns to read the Bible, it will forever unfit him to be a slave. He should know nothing but the will of his master and learn to obey it. As to himself, learning him will do him no good, but a great deal of harm, making him disconsolate and unhappy. If you teach him how to read, he'll want to know how to write, and this accomplish, he'll be running away with himself. The effect of his words on me was neither slight nor transitory. His iron sentences, cold and harsh, sunk like heavy weights deep into my heart and stirred up within me a rebellion not soon to be allayed. This was a new and special revelation, dispelling a painful mystery against which my youthful understanding had struggled and struggled in vain, to wit, the white man's power to perpetuate the enslavement of the black man. Very well, thought I. Knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. From that moment, 
I understood the direct pathway from slavery to freedom. Wise as Mr. Auld was, he underrated my comprehension and had little idea of the use to which I was capable of putting the impressive lesson he was giving to his wife. He wanted me to be a slave. That which he most loved, I most hated. And the very determination he expressed to keep me in ignorance only rendered me the more resolute to seek intelligence. Mrs. Auld evidently felt the force of what he said and like an obedient wife, began to shape her course in the direction indicated by him. My mistress, checked in her benevolent designs toward me, not only ceased in instructing me herself, but set her face as a flint against my learning to read by any means. She finally became even more violent in her opposition to my learning to read than was Mr. All himself. Nothing now appeared to make her more angry than seeing me seated in some nook or corner, quietly reading a book or newspaper. She would rush at me with the utmost fury and snatched a book or paper from my hand. The conviction once thoroughly established in her mind that education and slavery were incompatible with each other, I was most narrowly watched in all my movements. If I remained in a separate room from the family for any considerable length of time, I was sure to be suspected of having a book and was at once called to give an account of myself. But this was too late. The first and never to be retraced step had been taken. Teaching me the alphabet had been the inch given. I was now waiting only for the opportunity to take the L. Filled with the determination to learn to read at any cost, I hit upon many expedients to accomplish that much desired end. The plan which was the most successful was that of using as teachers my young white playmates with whom I met on the streets. I used almost constantly to carry a copy of Webster's spelling book in my pocket. And when set on errands or when playtime was allowed me, I would step aside with my young friends and take a lesson in spelling. I'm greatly indebted to these boys. Gustavus Dorgan, Joseph Bailey, Charles Farrity, and William Cosdry. Although slavery was a delicate subject, and in Maryland very cautiously talked about among grown-up people, I frequently talked with the white boys about it, and that very freely. I do not remember ever while I was in slavery to have met with a boy who defended the system, but I do remember many times when I was consoled by them and encouraged to hope that something would yet occur by which I would be made free. Over and over again they told me that they believed I had as good a right to be free as they had, and that they did not believe God ever made anyone to be a slave. When I was 13 years old and had succeeded in learning to read, I had by blacking boots for some gentleman earned a little money with which I purchased what was then a very popular school book, the Columbian Orator, for which I paid 50 cents. I was led to buy this book by hearing some little boys say that they were going to learn some pieces out of it. This volume was indeed a rich treasure, and for a time, every opportunity afforded me was spent in diligently perusing it. Among much interesting matter, that which I read again and again with unflagging satisfaction was a short dialogue between a master and his slave. The slave is represented as having been recaptured in a second attempt to run away, and the master opens the dialogue, charging the slave with ingratitude and demanding to know what he has to say in his own defense. Thus called upon to reply, the slave rejoins that he knows how little anything he can say will avail seeing that he is completely in the hands of his owner, and with noble resolution calmly says, I submit to my fate. Touched by the slave's answer, the master recapitulates the many acts of kindness which he has performed toward the slave, and tells him he is permitted to speak for himself. Well, thus invited, the slave made a spirited defense of himself, and thereafter the whole argument for and against slavery is brought out. 
The master was vanquished at every turn in the argument, and appreciating the fact, he generously and meekly emancipates the slave, with his best wishes for his prosperity. A dialogue with such an end, read by me when every nerve of my being was in revolt, affected me most powerfully. I could not help feeling that the day might yet come when the well-directed answers made by the slave to the master would find a counterpart in my own experience. My desire to learn increased, and especially did I want a thorough acquaintance with the contents of the Bible. I have gathered the scattered pages of the Bible from the filthy street gutters and washed and dried them, that in moments of leisure I might get a word or two of wisdom from them. It was not my enslavement at the then present time which most affected me. The being a slave for life was the saddest thought. I was too young to think of running away immediately. Besides, I wished to learn to write before going, as I might have occasion to write my own pass. I resolved to add to my educational attainments the art of writing. I was much in the shipyard, Master Hughes and that of Durgan and Bailey. And I observed that the carpenters, after hewing and getting ready a piece of timber to use, wrote on it the initials of the name of that part of the ship for which it was intended. When, for instance, a piece of timber was ready for the starboard side, it was marked with a capital S. A piece for the larboard side was marked L. Larboard forward was marked LF. Larboard aft was marked LA. I soon learned these letters and for what they were placed on the timbers. My work now was to keep fire under the steam box and to watch the shipyard while the carpenters had gone to dinner. This interval gave me a fine opportunity for copying the letters named. I soon astonished myself with the ease with which I made the letters and the thought was soon present. If I can make four letters, I can make more. Having made these readily and easily, when I met boys about the Bethel Church or on any of our playgrounds, I entered the list with them in the art of writing and would make the letters which I had been so fortunate to learn and ask them to beat that if they could. With my playmates for my teachers, fences and pavements for my copy books, and chalk for my pen and ink, I learned to write. The Civil War was raging nearby, but the South Carolina Sea Islands had fallen to the Northern Fleet. Charlotte L. Fortin, a 24-year-old black woman from a free, wealthy Philadelphia family, traveled south into the heart of rebeldom to teach the Sea Islands recently freed slaves. In her diary, the busy young teacher records the words and achievements of many freed people and the organization of the first regiment of black troops, the Journal of Charlotte L. Fortin. Tuesday. October 28th, 1862. Went into the commissary's office to wait for the boat which was to take us to St. Helena's Island. Tis here that Miss Town has a school in which I am to teach. It was nearly dark when we reached St. Helena's. We found Miss Town's carriage waiting for us and then we had a long drive along the lonely roads in the dark night. How easy it would have been for a band of guerrillas had any chanced that way to seize and hang us. But we feared nothing of the kind. We were in a jubilant state of mind and sang John Brown with a will as we drove through the pines and we soon began to feel quite at home in the very heart of rebeldom. Only that I do not at all realize yet that we are in South Carolina. It is all a strange wild dream from which I am constantly expecting to awake. Wednesday, October 29, we went into the school and heard the children read and spell. The teachers tell us that they have made great improvement in a very short time. And I noticed with pleasure how bright, how eager to learn many of them seem. The singing delighted me most. Besides several other tunes, they sang marching along with much spirit and then one of their own hymns, Down in the Lonesome Valley, 
which is sweetly solemn and most beautiful. Dear children, born in slavery, but free at last. May God preserve to you all the blessings of freedom. My heart goes out to you. I shall be glad to do all that I can to help you. Friday, October 31st. Miss Town went to Beaufort today, and I taught for her. I enjoyed it much. The children are well behaved and eager to learn. It will be a happiness to teach them. Wednesday, November 5th. Had my first regular teaching experience, but it was not a very pleasant one. Part of my scholars are very tiny. Babies, I call them. It is hard to keep them quiet and interested while I am hearing the larger ones. They are too young, even for the alphabet. These little ones were brought to school because the older children, in whose care their parents leave them while at work, could not come without them. I think I must ride home and ask somebody to send me picture books and toys to amuse them. Well, I must not be discouraged. Thursday, November 6th. Rained all day so that I couldn't go to school. Cut out a dress for an old woman, Venus, who thanked me and blessed me enough. It was a pleasure to hear her say what a happy year this has been for her. Nobody to whip me, nor drive me, and plenty to eat. Never had such a happy year in my life before. Promised to make a little dress for her great-grandchild, only a few weeks old. Monday, November 10th, commenced teaching the children, John Brown, which they entered into eagerly. I felt the full significance of that song being sung here in South Carolina by little Negro children, by those whom he, the glorious old man, died to save. Miss Town told them about him. Thursday, November 13th, talked to the children a little today about the noble Toussaint L'Ouverture. They listened very attentively. It is well that they should know what one of their own color could do for his race. I long to inspire them with courage and ambition of a noble sort and high purpose. This evening, Harry, one of the men on the place, came in for a lesson. He is most eager to learn and is really a scholar to be proud of. He learns rapidly. I gave him his first lesson in writing tonight, and his progress was wonderful. He held the pen almost perfectly right the first time. He will very soon learn to write, I think. I must inquire if there are not more of the grown people who would like to take lessons at night. It will be a real happiness to me to teach them. Thursday, November 27. Thanksgiving Day. This morning, a large number... Superintendents, teachers, and freed people assembled in the little Baptist church. It was a happy sight that I shall not soon forget. That crowd of eager, happy black faces from which the shadow of slavery had forever passed. Forever free. Forever free. Those magical words were all the time singing themselves in my soul. Mrs. Francis D. Gage told the people about the slaves in Santa Cruz, how they rose and conquered their masters and declared themselves free, and no one dared oppose them. General Saxton made a short but spirited speech to the people, urging the young men to enlist in the first black regiment now forming under Colonel T.W. Higginson. General Saxton said that he hoped to see him commander of an army of black men. The general assured them that they might feel sure of meeting no injustice under the leadership of such a man. I think what he said will have much effect on the young men here. There has been a good deal of distrust about joining the regiment. The soldiers were formerly so unjustly treated by the government, but they trust General Saxton. He told them what a victory the black troops had lately won on the Georgian coast and what a great good they had done for their race in winning. They had proved to their enemies that the black man can and will fight for his freedom. After the general had done speaking, the people sang marching along with great spirit. This has been the happiest, 
the most jubilant Thanksgiving day of my life. Friday, November 28th. Kept store nearly all day. A very old man, Dr. Crofts, they call him. His name is Scipio Rightly. Came into the store yesterday. He was rejoicing over the new state of things here and said, Don't have me feelings hurt now. Used to have me feelings hurt all the time, but don't have him hurt now, no more. We rejoiced with him that he and many like him no longer have their feelings hurt, as in the old time. Saturday, January 31st, 1863. Lizzie and I went to Beaufort after bread. We spent nearly all of our time at Harriet Tubman's, otherwise Moses. She is a wonderful woman, a real heroine, has helped off a large number of slaves after taking her own freedom. She used to hide them in the woods during the day and go around and get provisions for them. Once she had with her a man named Joe for whom a reward of $1,500 was offered. Frequently, in different places, she found handbills exactly describing him. But at last, they reached in safety the suspension bridge over the falls and found themselves in Canada. Until then, she said, Joe had been very silent. In vain had she called his attention to the glory of the falls. He sat perfectly still, moody, it seemed, and would not even glance at them. But when she said, Now we are in Canada, he sprang to his feet with a great shout, and sang and clapped his hands in a perfect delirium of joy. When they got out, and he first touched free soil, he shouted and hurrahed as if he were crazy, she said. How exciting it was to hear her tell the story, and to hear her sing the very scraps of jubilant hymns that he sang. She said the ladies crowded around them, and some laughed and some cried. My own eyes were full as I listened to her. The heroic woman. A reward of $10,000 was offered for her by the Southerners, and her friends deemed it best that she should for a time find refuge in Canada. And she did so, but only for a short time. She came back and was soon at the good, brave work again. I am glad I saw her. Very glad. Monday, February 2nd. I've just heard tonight of the return of the 1st Regiment. They came back with laurels and secesh prisoners. I'm glad, emphatically glad to know that they came back completely successful. Saturday, February 7th. Tina, an excellent woman from Palawana, came in and told us a very interesting story about two girls, one about ten, the other fifteen, who haven't been taken by their master up into the country, determined to try to get back to their parents, who had been left on this island. They stole away at night and traveled through woods and swamps for two days without eating. Sometimes their strength would fail, and they would sink down in the swamps and think they could go no further. But they had brave little hearts and struggled on till at last they reached Port Royal Ferry. There they were seen by a boatload of people who had also made their escape. The people, as soon as they reached this island, told the father of the children who immediately hastened to the ferry for them. The poor little creatures were almost wild with joy. Despite their exhausted state, when they saw their father coming to them, they are said to be very clever. I want to see the heroic little creatures. Another day, one of the black soldiers came in and gave us his account of the expedition up the St. Mary's River. No words of mine can give you any account of the state of exaltation and enthusiasm he was in. He was eager for another chance at Desesesh. I asked him what he would do if his master and others should come back and try to re-enslave him. I'd fight him, miss. I'd 
fight him till I turned to dust. He was especially delighted at the ire which the sight of the black troops excited in the minds of certain secesh women whom they saw. These vented their spleen by calling the men baboons dressed in soldiers' clothes and telling them that they ought to be at work in their master's rice swamps and that they ought to be lashed to death. And what did you say to them, I asked? Oh, miss, we only tell him, hold your tongue and dry up. You see, we wasn't fair of them. They couldn't hurt us now. Whew. <laughs> Did we laugh <laughs> to see them so mad? <laughs> the spirit of resistance to the secesh is strong in these men. The noble Robert Sutton, a former slave, whom Colonel Higginson calls the leader of the expedition, was wounded in three places and still kept at his post. Dr. Rogers speaks of him in the highest terms. He says he thinks he must be the descendant of some Nubian king. My heart is filled with an exceeding great joy tonight. Monday, February 9th. Had a perfectly immense school today. I had 58, at least two-thirds of whom were tiny ABC people. Found but little difficulty in managing and quieting the tiniest and most restless. I never before saw children so eager to learn, although I have had several years' experience in New England schools. Coming to school is a constant delight and recreation to these children. They come here as other children go to play. Of course, there are some stupid ones, but these are the minority. The majority learn with wonderful rapidity. Many of the grown people are desirous of learning to read. It is wonderful how a people who have been so long crushed to the earth can have so great a desire for knowledge and such a capability for attaining it. During the Civil War, a young black woman, Susie King Taylor, married a soldier and accompanied the 1st Regiment of Colored Troops. Mrs. Taylor, who as a slave had learned to read, taught, nursed, and cooked for the soldiers. Susie King Taylor, Reminiscences of my life in camp. I was born under the slave law in Georgia in 1848 and was brought up by my grandmother in Savannah. My brother and I, being the two oldest, we were sent to a friend of my grandmother, Mrs. Woodhouse, a widow, to learn to read and write. She was a free woman and lived about a half a mile from my house. We went every day about nine o'clock with our books wrapped in paper to prevent the police or white persons from seeing them. We went in, one at a time, through the gate, into the yard, to the kitchen, which was the schoolroom. She had 25 or 30 children whom she taught, assisted by her daughter, Mary Jane. The neighbors would see us going in sometimes, but they supposed we were there learning trades, as it was the custom to give children a trade of some kind. After school, we left the same way we ended, one by one, when we would go to a square about a block from the school and wait for each other. I remained at school for two years or more when I was sent to Mrs. Mary Beasley, where I continued until May 1860. When she told my grandmother, she had taught me all she knew, and grandmother had better get someone else who could teach me more. I had a white playmate about this time named Katie O'Connor who lived on the next corner and who attended a convent. One day she told me if I would promise not to tell her father, she would give me some lessons. On my promise not to do so, and getting her mother's consent, she gave me lessons about four months every evening. A month after this, James Blewis, our landlord's son, was attending the high school and was very fond of grandmother. So she asked him to give me a few lessons, which he did until the middle of 1861, when
when the Savannah Volunteer Guards, to which he belonged, were ordered to the front. In the first battle of Manassas, James deserted over to the Union side. I often wrote passes for my grandmother, for all colored persons, free or slaves, were compelled to have passes. I remember one night, my grandmother went out into the suburbs of the city to a church meeting, and they were fervently singing this old hymn. Yes, we all shall be free. Yes, we all shall be free. Yes, we all shall be free when the Lord shall appear. When the police came in and arrested all who were there, saying they were planning freedom and sang the Lord in place of Yankee, to blind anyone who might be listening, Grandmother never forgot that night. About this time, I had been reading so much about the Yankee, I was very anxious to see them. The whites would tell their colored people not to go to the Yankees, for they would harness them to carts and make them pull the carts around in place of horses. I asked grandmother one day if this was true. She replied, certainly not, that the white people did not want the slaves to go over to the Yankees and told them these things to frighten them. I wanted to see these wonderful Yankees so much as I heard my parents say the Yankee was going to set all the slaves free. Oh, how these people prayed for freedom. Two days after the taking of Fort Pulaski, my uncle took his family of seven and myself to St. Catherine Island. We landed under the protection of the Union fleet. About 30 of us were taken aboard a gunboat to be transferred to St. Simon's Island. Captain Whitmore, commanding the boat, asked me where I was from. I told him Savannah, Georgia. He asked if I could read. I said, yes. Can you write? He next asked. Yes, I can do that also, I replied. And as if he had some doubts of my answers, he handed me a book and pencil and told me to write my name and where I was from. I did this. He was surprised at my accomplishments, for he said he did not know there were any Negroes in the South able to read or write. After I had been on St. Simon's about three days, Commander Goldsborough came to Gaston Bluff to see me. He said Captain Whitmore had spoken to him of me and said he was pleased to hear of my being so capable and wished me to take charge of a school for the children on the island. I told him I would gladly do so if I could have some books. He said I should have them, and in a week or two, I received two large boxes of books and testaments from the North. I had about 40 children to teach, beside a number of adults who came to me nights, all of them so eager to learn to read, to read above anything else. The latter part of August, 1862, Captain C.T. Trowbridge came to St. Simon's Island to get all the men possible to finish filling his regiment. He found me at Gaston Bluff, teaching my little school. He was much interested in it. Captain Trowbridge and the men he had enlisted went to camp at Old Fort, which they named Camp Saxton. I was enrolled as a laundress. The first colored troops did not receive any pay for 18 months, and the men had to depend wholly on what they received from the commissary. A great many of these men had large families, and as they had no money to give them, their wives were obliged to support themselves and their children by washing for the officers of the gunboats and the soldiers, and making cakes and pies, which they sold to the boys in the camp. Finally, in 1863, the government decided to give them half pay. But the men would not accept this. They wanted full pay or nothing. They preferred rather to give their services to the state, which they did until 1864, when the government granted them full pay with all the back pay due. Robert Defoe and several of our boys were captured while tapping some telegraph wires. Robert Defoe was confined in jail for about 20 months. He made his escape and joined his company. He had not been paid, as he had refused 
the reduced pay offered by the government. Before we got to camp, he sickened and died of smallpox, never having been paid one cent for nearly three years of service. He left no heirs, and his account was never settled. I taught a great many of the comrades in Company E to read and write when they were off duty. Nearly all were anxious to learn. I was very happy to know my efforts were successful and also felt gratitude for the appreciation of my services. I gave my services willingly for four years and three months without receiving a dollar. I was glad, however, to be allowed to go with the regiment to care for the sick and afflicted comrades. I learned to handle a musket very well while in the regiment and could shoot straight and often hit the target. I assisted in cleaning guns and used to fire them off to see if the cartridges were dry before cleaning and reloading each day. I thought this great fun. I was also able to take a gun apart and put it together again. When at Cap Shaw, I visited the hospital in Beaufort, where I met Clara Barton. There were a number of sick and wounded soldiers there, and I went often to see the comrades. Miss Barton was always very cordial toward me, and I honor her for her devotion and care of these men. Finally, orders were received for the boys to prepare to take Fort Gregg. I helped as many as I could to pack haversacks and cartridge boxes. The fourth day, about five o'clock in the afternoon, the call was sounded. I have never forgotten the goodbyes of that day as they left camp. Colonel Trowbridge said to me as he left, Goodbye, Mrs. King. Take care of yourself if you don't see us again. I went with them as far as the landing and watched them until they got out of sight. About four o'clock, July 2nd, the charge was made. The firing could be plainly heard in camp. When the wounded began to arrive, the first one brought in was Samuel Anderson of our company. He was badly wounded. A number of the men were lost. Some got fastened in the mud and had to cut off the legs of their pants to free themselves. My work now began. I asked the doctor at the hospital what I could do or what I could get for them to eat. They wanted soup, but that I could not get. But I had a few cans of condensed milk and some turtle eggs, so I thought I would try to make some custard. I had doubts as to my success, for cooking with turtle eggs was something new to me. But I made a venture, and the result was a very delicious custard. This I carried to the men who enjoyed it very much. I was on hand to assist whenever needed. I was enrolled as company laundress, but I did very little of it because I was employed all the time doing something for the officers and comrades. Colonel Trowbridge brought into camp one day a poor, thin little pig. That pig grew to be the pet of the camp and was the special care of the drummer boys who taught him many tricks and so well did they train him that every day at practice and dress parade, his pig ship would march out with them, keeping perfect time with their music. The drummers would often disturb the devotions by riding this pig into the evening praise meeting. And many were the complaints made to the colonel. And he was always very lenient to all the boys, for he knew that they only did this for mischief. I shall never forget the fun we had in camp with Piggy. The regiment, under Colonel Trowbridge, reached Charleston in November 1865. On February 9, 1866, the following general orders were received and the regiment mustered out. General order number one. Comrades, the hour is at hand when we must separate forever and nothing can take from us the pride we feel when we look upon the history of the first black regiment that ever bore arms in defense of freedom on the continent of America. 
the alacrity with which you responded to the call gave abundant evidence of your readiness to strike a manly blow for the liberty of your race. From the little band of hopeful, trusting, and brave men who gathered in the fall of 62 has grown an army of 140,000 black soldiers whose valor and heroism has won for your race a name which will live as long as the undying pages of history shall endure. Officers and soldiers of the 33rd United States Colored Troops, I bid you all farewell. Lieutenant Colonel C.T. Trowbridge. My dear friends, there are many people who do not know what colored women did during the war. There were hundreds of them who assisted the Union soldiers by hiding them and helping them to escape. Many were punished for taking food for the prisoners to the prison stockades. Others assisted in various ways the Union Army. These things should be kept in history before the people. Nat Love was born a slave in Davidson County, Tennessee in 1854. In his autobiography, Nat Love tells how he set out west, became a cowboy, and won the name Deadwood Dick. The Life and Adventures of Nat Love. It was on the 10th day of February, 1869, that I left the old home near Nashville, Tennessee. I was at that time about 15 years old. And though my young in years, the hard work and farm life had made me strong and hearty, much beyond my years. And I had full confidence in myself as being able to take care of myself and making my own way. I had once struck out for Kansas believing it was a good place in which to seek employment. It was in the West, and it was the great West I wanted to see. And so by walking and occasional lifts from farmers going my way, I eventually brought up at Dodge City, Kansas, which at that time was a typical frontier city, with a great many saloons, dance halls, and gambling houses, <laughs> and very little of anything else. When I arrived, the town was full of cowboys from the surrounding ranches and other parts of the West. As Kansas was a great cattle center and market, the wild cowboy, prancing horses of which I was very fond, and the wildlife generally, all had their attraction for me. And I decided to try for a place with them. Approaching a party who were eating their breakfast, I got to speak with them. They asked me to have some breakfast with them which invitation I gladly accepted. But during the meal, I, I got a chance to ask them many questions. They proved to be a Texas outfit who had just come up with a herd of cattle. And having delivered them, they were preparing to return. There were several colored cowboys among them, and good ones, too. After breakfast, I asked the camp boss for a job as a cowboy. And he asked me if I could ride a wild horse. I said, yes, sir. Camp boss laughed and said, well, let's see you ride, good eye. He said, if you can, I'll give you a job. So he spoke to one of the colored cowboys called Bronco Jim and told him to go out and rope old good eye, saddled him and put me on his back. So all the cowboys crowded in to watch the fun. Bronco Jim gave me a few pointers and told me to look out for the horse it was especially bad on pitching. I told Jim I was a good rider, not afraid. I thought I had rode pitching horses before. But from the time I mounted old good eye, I knew I had not learned what pitching was. This proved the worst horse to ride I had ever mounted in my life. But I stayed with him, and the cowboys were the most surprised outfit you ever saw, as they had taken me for a tenderfoot, pure and simple. After the horse got tired and I dismounted, the boss said he'd give me a job and pay me $30 a month and more later on. The boss took me to the city and got my outfit, which consisted of a new saddle, 
bridle and spurs, chaps, a pair of blankets, and a fine forty-five Colt revolver. He asked what my name was, and I answered, Nat Love. He said to the boys, you call him Red River Dick. Well, I went by this name for a long time. In the fall of 1872, I received and accepted a better position with the Pete Gallinger Company, whose immense range was located on the Gila River in southern Arizona. And I soon became one of their most trusted men, taking an important part in all the big roundups, sometimes riding 80 miles a day for days at a time. Naturally, I soon became well known among the cowboys, rangers, scouts, and guides it was my pleasure to meet in my wanderings over the country in the wake of immense herds of the Longhorn Texas cattle and large bands of range horses. Now, many of these men who were my companions on the trail and in camp have since become famous in story and history, and a braver, truer set of men never lived than these wild sons of the plains whose home was in the saddle and their couch Mother Earth, with the sky for a covering. They were always ready to share their blanket and their last ration with a less fortunate fellow companion and always assisted each other in the many trying situations that were continually coming up in a cowboy's life. Well, after the general roundup was over, cowboy sports and a good time generally was in order for those engaged in it. The interest of nearly all of us centered in the riding of what was known as the 7YL steer. A big longhorn wild steer, generally the worst in the herd, was cut out and turned loose on the open prairie. The cowboy who could rope and ride him would get the steer as his reward. And let me assure you that it was not so easy as it sounds, as the steer separated from its fellows would become extremely ferocious and wild and the man who attempted to rope and ride him would be in momentary danger of losing his life if he relaxed in the least, his vigilance and caution, because a wild steer is naturally ferocious. Even in cutting them out of the roundup, I've known them to get mad and attack the cowboys who only saved themselves by the quickness of their horses or the friendly intervention of a comrade who happened to be near to rope the maddened longhorn and thus divert his attention to other things. But in the case of the 7YL steer, such intervention is against the rules, and the cowboy who attempts to rope and ride the steer must at all times look out for himself. I've seen two horses and their riders gored to death in this sport, and I've had to shoot more than one steer to save myself and horse after my horse had fallen with me and placed himself as well as me at the maddened beast's mercy. At such times, it takes a cool head and a steady hand, as no random shot will stop a wild steer. The bullet must be placed in a certain spot, in the center of the forehead, to accomplish its mission. The last time I had a horse fall with me in roping a seven YL steer, he fell as the steer was but a few feet away, falling in such a way that my leg caught under the saddle, holding me fast. Well, quick as I could, I gave the steer a bullet in the head, and he stumbled and fell dead on top of my horse and me, so that the boys had to interfere to the extent of dragging the steer and horse off my leg. And the cowboy who's successful in roping the steer must then mount and ride him. If he does that successfully, the steer becomes his personal property to do with as he will, only a slight reward for the risking of his life and the trouble of accomplishing the feat. But... It's done more for the sport's sake than anything else, and the love of showing off the weakness of all cowboys, more or less. But really, it takes a high class of horsemanship to ride a longhorn, to get on his back and stay there as he runs, jumps, pitches, sideways, backwards, forward, up and down, and then over the prairie like a streak of lightning. I've had the experience, and I can assure you, it is no child's play. More than one seven YL steer has fallen to my lot, but I had to work for it and work hard. After all, it was only part of the general routine of the cowboy's life in which danger plays so important a part. None of us would have foregone the sport had we known that sure death awaited us as a result. In the spring of 1876, orders were received at the home ranch 
for 3,000 head of three-year-old steers to be delivered near Deadwood, South Dakota. This being one of the largest orders we had ever received at one time, every man around the ranch was placed on his mettle to execute the order in record time. Well, we arrived in Deadwood in good condition without having had any trouble with the Indians on our way up. We turned the cattle over to their new owners at once, then proceeded to take in the town. The next morning, July 4th, the gamblers and mining men made up a purse of $200 for a roping contest between the cowboys that were then in town. And as it was a holiday, nearly all the cowboys from miles around were assembled there that day. It didn't take long to arrange the details for the contest and the contestants, six of them being colored cowboys, including myself. Our trail boss was chosen to pick out the Mustangs from a herd of wild horses just off the range, and he picked out 12 of the most wild and vicious horses that he could find. The conditions of the contest were that each of us who were mounted was to rope, throw, tie, bridle, and saddle, and mount the particular horse picked for us in the shortest time possible. The man accomplishing the feat in the quickest time to be declared the winner. It seems to me that the horse chosen for me was the most vicious of the lot. Everything being in readiness, the 45 cracked. And we all sprang forward together, each of us making for a particular Mustang. I roped through, tied, bridled, saddled, and mounted my Mustang in exactly nine minutes from the crack of the gun. Time of the next nearest competitor was 12 minutes and 30 seconds. This gave me the record and championship of the West, which I held up to the time I quit the business in 1890. It is worthy of passing remark that I never had a horse pitch me so much as that Mustang, but I never stopped sticking my spurs in him and using my quirt on his flanks until I proved his master. Right there, the assembled crowd named me Deadwood Dick and proclaimed me champion roper of the Western cattle country. A shooting contest was arranged for the afternoon as there happened to be some of the best shots with rifle and revolve in the West present that day. Among them were Stormy Jim, who claimed the championship, Powderhorn Bill, who had the reputation of never missing what he shot at, also Whitehead, who generally hit what he shot at, and many other men who knew how to handle a rifle or forty-five coat. The range was measured off 100 and 250 yards for the rifle and 150 for the coat forty-five. At this distance, a bullseye about the size of an apple was put up. Every man was to have 14 shots at each range with the rifle and 12 shots with the Colt 45. I placed every one of my 14 shots with the rifle in the bullseye with ease, all shots being made from the hip. But with the 45 Colts, oh, I missed it twice, only placing 10 shots in the small circle. Stormy Jim being my nearest competitor, placing eight bullets in the bull's eye clear, the rest being quite close. Now with the 45, he placed five bullets in a charmed circle. This gave me the championship of rifle and revolver shooting, as well as the roping contest. And for that day, I was the hero of Deadwood, and the purse of $200, which I had won on the roping contest, went towards keeping things moving. And it did move as only a large crowd of cattlemen can move things. This lasted for several days. The name of Deadwood Dick was given me by the people of Deadwood, South Dakota, July 4, 1876, after I had proven myself worthy to carry it, and after I had defeated all comers in riding, roping, and shooting. And I've always carried the name with honor since that time. <laughs>